You don't have to clap before I start. You may. <laughs> that might be the only applause we get today, Bob. Um, yes, as Bob mentioned, Law at Home Trust and Wells Reserve. Um, go ahead and keep your phones up. This is going to be interactive today. I won't feel bad if you're on your phones during the parts where I ask you to be on your phones. You can also be on your phones otherwise, but you might miss something. Um, I'm Nick Charov. As Bob said, those, that's, those are my titles. Um, that's my contact info. It'll appear at the end again, should you want to follow up with anything I insult you with here today. Um, this is about environmental ethics. All right, all right, good. Um, I just had a bunch of slides with animations that are like dad jokes, like when I do this, I say, my 11 year old and eight year old think that's funny and nobody else does. Um, my talk here today for you all has a musical accompaniment and it's called How to Save the World Without Really Trying. That's that fine. Was, that was an alarm to come to your stage though. Good for you, you made it out of bed. It's only two o'clock. <laughs> Um, how to save the world without really trying. I don't know if that's the title we, I sent up or agreed upon. That's the title I had. Um, it's close enough. Um, it's, I don't know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately with the political climate, the elections, uh, and the work that I do uh, working in the environment with Dr. Chris Fort there down at the Wells Reserve and uh, what I've been doing for my entire career now. So I'm going to tell you a story about kind of the work that I, I've done and I'm doing, and I'm gonna ask for your input along the way, and at the end, I'm going to ask your advice and feedback on it. Um, if I get the technology to work correctly, it will be interactive, so before I go any farther, let me just check that the technology is working. Uh, da, 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 da. Can you all go to menti.com? I think the poll has started, so if you log in there and start voting, things should start appearing. Uh, all right, good, it works, mostly. And there's, I know there's at least 24 of you out there watching. Good, all right, that's a test of the technology. Uh, yes, the correct answer is the weather outside will not be the same as the climate. Um, that's an environmental joke also that my kids don't get. Um, all right, back to the slides. So here's a talk. Here's my spiel, Here, here's my pitch. We'll see if you agree with it at the end or not. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, which this is not, um, but I spent a few weeks every summer coming up to uh, uh, Peaks Island off of uh, Portland. And that's where I kind of grew a love for the environment and, and you know, my, my formative times were spent clambering across the rocks. There, there's me as a young lad of 36, um, jumping around the coast there. And I'd always loved coming up there, but I went away to school back in the 90s to the West Coast, um, to apparently the world's largest Taco Bell, and um, it was a, a break for me from the East Coast, from New England, from snow in November. Um, oh, I went off to study, hold on, what did you study? Let's find out what you all studied. All right, uh, medical something, animal behavior, got that good. Nobody is in some useless, unemployable liberal art except you grumbling back there. Um, all right, good, good for me to know, just to see. Yeah, I was out here and I studied physics and engineering and computer science and math and I failed all of those and got a degree in philosophy, uh, an unemployable, useless liberal art if there ever was one. And I graduated at the, the peak of the, the dot-com era, the first dot-com era, late 90s. When you graduate at the peak of something and you don't realize it's the peak, um, there's nowhere to go but down. So very quickly, um, I came in here. Laser doesn't, ran out of batteries. Uh, I came in at the top of the peak there and didn't realize it, but within 18 months I was uh, jobless and homeless and on my way back to my mother's basement in Connecticut for two years. Um, not a place you want to end up in your early 20s. Um, it was not a pretty picture. Uh, things did not go well for two years. Um, not close, well, I mean, almost an actual photo. I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of thinking. I knew I wanted to do something with science and education and writing and art, you know, just basically everything. 
Um, I came up to Maine a lot. I did a lot of writing up here. Um, I really began to think that I could change the world. And, I don't know, it didn't seem like a naive idea. Do you think you can change the world? Agree or disagree? Your college students, your millennials. Um, well, all right, that's mixed results. 14 to 10, disagree. We'll come back to that one. So there I was thinking I could possibly live in Maine, change the world. So I said I should really move to New York City. Um, I got down there. I lived in Long Island City before it was Amazonia um, and took the first job I could. Uh, basically, you know, I'm still basically out of school here, having had and lost a couple jobs already. Um, I started working for a science museum. New York Hall of Science is a hands-on place. sees about 400,000 kids a year. My office is right on the other side of this wall, so I heard all of them. And uh, I started there doing fundraising and marketing and program development. And it, it was great. It was a great kind of first entry level job. If you're interested in the environment, well, if you're interested in science and education, go to work for an established institution like a museum that does these sorts of things. You get to meet kids all day. Uh, you get to work with very inspired young people, uh, professional older types who have also been in the game for a long time. I, I, I loved it there. Um, I back, This was back in about 2005. I got to be a big part of this. Um, we were developing an ex exhibition around evolution and this case got uh, back uh, up into the news where they started trying to overturn evolution uh, teaching in schools again. For the, they hadn't tried to do, do that since the 1930s. So I, 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 was, I was in heaven. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, public understanding of science was, was something that I was really interested in and I, I, I was right on the front lines. And we were working on it all, all the time at this Hall of Science. Um, and we got to do major science projects, research papers, published works, uh, big grant proposals to the government. Um, I felt I was making a difference. I was changing the world in a very small way from a very small office, um, at least a little bit. I did have other things on my mind, being in my mid-20s. Uh, there was a girl. Um, soon there was a boy. Uh, you could sell, I was definitely from New England. And um, yeah, something was snagging at me as soon as this guy came along. Um, I wasn't just uh, kind of living my own, own life anymore. I had a responsibility to this guy. He hates this picture. Um, I needed to think about the future, the next generation. Um, wow, that's about what I expected to see. Good for you all. Think about families. I was thinking about families. Um, about now, uh, when this guy was, he's 11 now. Still hates this photo. This was starting to bother me uh, as soon as I had a, a kid. There's this whole climate change thing, which by 2000, this was 2005 or so, 2006, was, was really starting to come to a fore. Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. Uh, that was a big catalyst. And, and these these scary graphs started to come along. I mean, this one just, I, I put this in all my presentations just because it's, that is scary right there. That, that's, that's me, it's a different kind of debt. But it definitely, this was bothering me a lot. So um, just thinking about the future, I, I, my son got concerned as well. He saw my concern. I was like, I gotta go work in the environment. Hands on science exhibits are fun, but it was all chemistry and math and astronomy, and it was not climate change. It was not environmental ethics. It was not, you know, what should we do now? Um, I didn't want to avoid the responsibility anymore. And another guy with a PowerPoint um, also was, was banging the drum around this time. And so, you know, if he could do it, so could I. Which made me realize I should really move to uh, another environmental nonprofit. This is Bette Midler. She ran a, uh, an environmental nonprofit in New York City called New York Restoration Project. Um, it's kind of a Robin Hood kind of conservancy group. Uh, took places like that and made them like that. Um, places like that and made them like that. It's real boots on the ground environmental work. You know, you go into a place, you clean it up, 
and it gets better across the five boroughs, all different parts of them, go into a really poor neighborhoods, bring all the resources you can bear, all, all the hedge fund money that you can scrape up, repurpose, and uh, create spaces in perpetuity that people can come to, find nature in, in the city. Great job, an environmental job. Sure, it's not climate change, but I was working on you know, environmental progress on a manageable scale. Uh, millions of dollars poured into projects like this. Um, yeah, it was satisfying. But for every five gardens we built, we had a hundred lots like this. And even if we left anything for too long, it would go back to those piles of tires. It would go back to lots like this. This is pretty typical. And in 300 square miles of city and, I don't know, 8 million inhabitants and 40 million tourists, um, it's still a city, and it was still a place where, you know, we, my wife and I said, this is not a place to raise, raise healthy children or even <laughs> survive, not without Amazon buying up half of our neighborhood. Um, so which means we finally, we, this is where we moved to the we side, we should finally move to, ah, Maine, finally made it in two, 2012, and got to come up to the work at the Wells Reserve. This place up here, Laud Home Farm, the Wells Reserve. Some of you come down with uh, Professor Grumbling. Some of you just get visitors from there, uh, like me and Bob. Bob will come up and teach. I'll come up and lecture. I do this every few years or so. Um, come up and heckle you students. But this is where we tend to gravitate. Dr. Fort works there half time uh, during the week. And um, this is, it, well, it's a, it's a place to finally combine science and education, art and conservation in a way that, you know, I, I've always wanted to combine them in a place that's been doing it for 30 years. A beautiful spot. It was its own restoration project a long time ago, but now it's a nice place to get married. In case anybody's looking for that, you're thinking about family? We rent out the barn for weddings. Just putting that plug in there for our revenue streams, Chris. Um, it's a great place to work. It's a really brilliant, passionate, committed people working on the environment. I was back in Maine, I had fresh air, good schools, a home, and natural beauty and a purpose at this Wells Reserve. This, it's one of 29 estuarine research reserves in the entire country. It's, they're like national parks with research labs. And uh, science is, is our bread and butter. Social science, hard science, biological research out in the marsh. Uh, it's what we do, it's research, education, and stewardship. Yes, son, I was still working on, finally working on climate change. Um, to me, I get to work on this. I, I feel like, you know, many days of the week, I'm doing my part. The Wells Reserve studies the Gulf of Maine, this changing place. That's us right there, a little red spot there. There we are. And Maine changing coast. Um, the way things are going, there's still that nagging idea in my head that the way things are going I feel a little bit of your fear, uncertainty. I do not necessarily agree um, that I can change the world anymore because it's changing so fast uh, around us. And I mean, we're looking at if the projections are right, which I think they are, they tend to get worse every year. Uh, we're looking at by the end of the century. So you were all born around 2000, I guess, or maybe a little right before that. So you've got a very good chance of living to be 100. So by 2100, Maine is supposed to have, let's say, conservatively, six feet of sea level rise, latest estimates from the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And the temperatures of southern New Jersey to South Carolina, somewhere in there, depending on what happens in this future, th these next now 82 years. That's a different Maine than the one I moved to. It's a different one than you've grown up in. So. That's in your lifetime. I mean, what's going to happen? What could happen? What might happen? What will happen? I mean, we're going to keep studying it at the Wells Reserve. That's, that's what we love to do. And I'm going to keep working on it, uh, supporting it, communicating it, advancing it. And I can trace back all this work that I do now to this kind of little short little life story, career story I just told you. Um, I get to do it. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm saving the world. I think. Yay. Happy ending. Done. Happy future. They're all set.
Great for them. Right? This has been bothering me lately, and we're running a, a project in our national system of, of estuarine research reserves about how people in the environmental world are beginning to think about all this, this, these challenges that lie ahead. I think I'm saving the world a little bit every day. Every day I wake up and I get to come to work and through, through that, save the world, like the talk title here, a little bit. Just doing what I do, what I've always done, and what I've always cared about. That's enough, right? I no longer think that I can save the world. I would now answer disagree to I can save the world. Um, arguably, the world in the 20 years I've been working is worse than it was <laughs> 20 years ago um, in some ways. Uh, but it's, uh, what it has taken me uh, about 20 years to figure out is that no one person can save the world. Um, even the, the exemplars that we put up there that we think have been one person that has changed the world, they have not done it alone. That's not to say there's no hope, um, just that it's a huge problem. I don't think any one person should be able to do it. Uh, it doesn't have to be climate change, any big problem out there. It would have been solved if it were easy to solve. All, all these problems that we have, they require more than just one person. I'm not saying there's no hope, but I wonder if you are saying that. Let's, let's keep on climate change here. That's kind of my thing. Well, that's about 26 responses there. That, that's about what I expected there. Yeah, we're pretty sure there's a, something going on. Marginally sure, mostly sure that there are ways to address it. Somewhat sure that, somewhat agree that we can apply those ways. And I think markedly less sure that we will actually do it. And that's, that's been my problem lately. Yeah, there are solutions. There are totally solutions. Um, they're out there. Uh, this has become one of my favorite kind of pick-me-up websites. Um, drawdown.org. I don't know, have you seen this, anybody? I'll just do, I'll do the non-phone poll. Anybody seen this site before? Drawdown.org has taken, I think there's, it doesn't say here, but there's 200 solutions to climate change. And they've ranked them about, they've scored them on how much they'll cost, how much they'll save, um, what they'll do to knock down carbon dioxide and also promote a better world. And they rank them. And you can go and click deeply into these things, find out who's working on them, this is it. This is your one-stop website for, for hope. These are where all the solutions live. And this is going to be my, I think my point is that how do you save the world? Um, you don't, but you, we, all of us, and all those people working on all those things maybe have a chance to. Um, so work on something you like. Take a small corner find a job. You like solar power? Revision Energy here in Maine is a great company. Um, like wind power. Wind is, is poised to become a, a huge thing, not just in Maine, but all over the country. Um, you like farming. Plenty to farm around here. Um, you can work on all of these, 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 the big problem, you can work on little bits of it. Uh, become a politician or a government employee. Legislate and regulate better. Become an engineer, science the shit out of this problem. Um, become a farmer, become a nonprofit uh, executive director and fundraiser for nonprofits, find resources, money and people to work on these things. That's what I get to do. Come and work for me when we have a job opening. Um, keep thinking about it. That is, for the most part, the end of my presentation. I just want to talk about this. One more thing. Still the same answers or no? Did I convince you or not? I convinced them that they can't save the world. Environmental ethics right there, Bob. You're welcome. All right, that's, I'm going to just half an hour. I'm keeping you for just one half hour more and then you get to go because it's a snow night and you're gonna be 
sledding all day tomorrow. Um, you can type them in. You can throw them out. That's my spiel at the moment. That's where my head is at after 20 years in this game. You're just starting out. What do you got? I hope you have solutions. Thank you. Good thing we applauded at the front, Bob. Wow. Are there questions? I'm afraid to look at the board. Two questions. Uh, where in Connecticut are you from? I'm from a small town called East Haddam on the Connecticut River. Who asked that? You from Connecticut? Sorry. Uh, what's the most progress that you think you have, you, you, as in me, personally? Who asked the question? You? Me. Uh, I'm raising good kids that'll have to take care of this problem. That's a good question. I mean, again, you can make, personally, I believe, and this is me, challenge me on this. I'm throwing this out there to you. <laughs> um, I think one person can't do much, so I'm, I'm going to do what I can do. Let's raise good kids. New York City is a great place to raise your kids. Statement, not a question. Who's from New York here? Yeah. Well, it's not true. Look at yourself. What are we working on now in Wells? Um, lobster research. Uh, environmental education for kids, K through gray. Uh, social science research. Getting people to talk to each other about these, these problems, about how to adapt. Getting towns to talk with their townspeople getting leaders to talk amongst themselves, um, and also just protecting land, both at the Wells Reserve and around it, kind of building in some insurance for the future. That's what we're working on at the Wells Reserve. What are some of the solutions that you think we can achieve? All of them. Who asked that question? It's okay. All, I think. I mean, we have to do all of them if we're going to make it to 2200, is how I feel. So you got to do them all. Everybody's got to work on something. I, I don't. Did, I'm going to ask you questions soon. How did you become president? Um, I was not elected. I was hired. Um, there was a job opening, and I applied from New York because I wanted to come to Maine desperately. In your opinion, how do you think you could convince everyone to work together to save the world? Giving presentations at colleges. That's that's my one. No, I mean, by showing people, uh, by, by being, be the change you want to be. Um, by showing people that, that it works. Um, I think we do need to talk to each other more, um, Democrats and Republicans. I seek out my Republican friends, of which I have two, and I ask them things, and I ask them to explain to me their thinking, and through that process, I understand a little bit more. I'm, I'm more centrist than I used to be because of those conversations. Um, and that, that helps a bit. Um, in your opinion, how do you think you could convince? I want to stick on that question a little bit. I'm going to ask that question back to you in a second. What are my kids' names? Huckleberry and Max. Huck, Huck is the older one. He was the one who was in here. Um, what can you and he do realistically that will help that we are not already doing? I don't know what you're doing. You tell me. I'll ask, I'll ask that in a second. I'll get through these. Do I recycle? Yes, but recycling's a myth. I don't believe in recycling. I think it all goes into a landfill in China. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced recycling works. I've seen piles and piles of clothing and cardboard and plastic, and you know, every time I throw something in, I'm like, hmm. And you know, we'll throw away like a soiled can or something, and we'll put it in recycling, and I turn to my wife, I'm like, that's, we're just wishing that's gonna be recycled. It's really just gonna be thrown away somewhere. Um, I, there are like metal recycling works. Um, I still recycle. I mean, I, st I think it's the right thing to do. I wish it worked better. That's one of those things that's in that list on drawdown.org. If recycling um, got the attention and creativity that it deserves, um, it would work a lot better. You get into packaging design. How would, you get a box from Amazon, headquartered in Long Island City, New York. Um, you get a box from Amazon that comes with those inflatable bags or worse, peanuts, and there's a big box, and then there's like a little thing, like there's a memory stick inside, and it's a box this big. It's, we can do better than that. Um, do I compost? Yes, I do. And I garden, and I'm a very poor gardener. 
Um, but I try. I don't get a lot of sun in my yard. But composting is great. I love, we've taken our garbage bags down from like three a week to one a week just because of composting. It's mostly food scraps. And we're vegetarians uh, for the most part in my house, except me and my wife and one of my sons. We try. It's like five nights a week is this vegetarian. Um, what are small things we should start incorporating? Um, yeah, change your diet, change your approach. Question why we do things. That goes back to these. So that you're, I'm, I'm going to ask some of your questions back to you. What can you and E do realistically that will help that we are not already? So what are you doing now? You don't have to put it up there. You can just say it. You recycle and you compost, all right? I, I bet there's a lot of recycling and compost that comes out of a, a campus this large. Where does it go? Okay. Okay. Compost goes to a farm in Portland. The recycling materials go to a recycling plant, and then it's a bottle, it's a bottle plant. Okay. So bottles, yeah. All right. See that. Investigate recycling, because I know people in the waste management business, and they are more skeptical. It's possible. Check it out. What else does UNE do? Professors. Bird resisting glass. I have many ideas of what that could mean. What does that actually mean? You just blew my mind, Owen. Yeah. It's reflect, birds can't see uh, their reflections often, sometimes. And windows are the number one killer of birds in America. Something like two billion birds a year smack into windows. Right behind them, cats, everyone, household cats and feral cats. We're building a lot of buildings lately. Um, yeah, all right, bird, uh, bird resistant windows. That's good. I like that. Those are small changes. That's, that's like one person or a small group of people saying, we're going to make a difference. We like birds. We care about birds. We can do that. I like that. That's one small step, but not for the birds, as they say. What else? What else can you do? I'll go back to that drawdown thing. Only the top few. Where is it? Shoot. There it is. Only the top seven we listed. I love these ones. That's the whole, the population management one. I'm not one of those people that think that, you know, we're on a crash course for 50 billion people. Um, I think the population will level off mid-century, but it'll do that a lot faster with family planning and educating uh, girls uh, across the developing world. That's a big one. Um, Plant-rich diet, that's your vegetarianism. Reduced food waste, there's your composting. Wind, Mentioned solars here in, in Maine. This one I, I had no idea about. If anybody is interested in refrigerant management. How does this relate to environmental ethics? Sorry, Lee, am I moving around for you? Gotcha. I'll, I'll stay in my, hit my mark. Um, how does this relate to environmental ethics? Have you taken the, uh, have you done the environmental reading courses? Have you read historical, uh, not historical fiction, historical pieces about these? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. In with refrigerants, yeah, I think that's it. Breaks there are there's ozone breaking down refrigerants out there. There's also just CO two emitting refrigerants out there, or they're even worse than CO two. They're they they are greenhouse gases of their own kind. Yeah, that would help a lot too. Um, this is kind of a, it's a new problem. This climate change thing we've known about it for 150 years. We've been able to deal with it for about half that time, perhaps. And the effects are only now, if you look at the news, very, very visually uh, coming to bear. So this is, this is it. I mean, you're, you're the first generation that gets to live it uh, on an almost daily basis. California, the Gulf Coast. 
lots of Southeast Asia. Um, climate change is here and it's happening. So what do you do about it? These things, there's a whole list at drawdown.org. I do not work for drawdown.org, but I recommend you check it out. Yeah, Bob. Mass transit's a big, uh, yeah, I think it's like in the top 10. That's good. There's a windmill for, <laughs> there's a windmill for sale. I, we got back, we went to Texas last year. Texas is just lined with windmills. It's, I mean, it's like, you know, you think of Texas, you think of oil, but it's, it's nothing but windmills on the horizon. They're, I think they're leading the country or they're number two. It's like the Plains states somewhere in there. But um, they are cranking with wind. You make better windmills. You find a way to store uh, renewable energy like solar and wind, these intermittent sources. You figure that out the way Tesla is trying to. We, we solve this thing. So, these things are, in a way, easy. And yet, <laughs> if they were easy, they would have been done by now. It's in the details. What else? Can I go back to the, the questions? Are there still questions popping up? Yeah, we can do it the old-fashioned way. What do you think it means? Why are you asking? Um, uh, no, I, it's in in the um, in the developing world. I think um, the feeling is that uh, girls are kept out of traditional education systems to be family raisers and, and homemakers, and that takes out fifty percent of the. Intel, probably more of the intelligent population, and um, yeah, they're not they're not being able to contribute to solving these problems. They're it, it, it would seem very important to educate girls, don't you think? I'm surprised you couldn't answer that. How do you think it would affect climate change? Did I? I think it also goes hand in hand with the family planning, is that it just it limits population. To, I think there are 200 items. Anybody on drawdown.org at the moment? There's like 200. We can go through all of them right now. I've got time. So I'm, I'm getting that you're, you're piqued by this. Why? Yeah, look, you're already working on this problem inadvertently. Thanks, Bob. Good job. Yeah. I mean, possibly not so much in, you know, the U.S. and, but, you know, we could still, yeah. I mean, just look at, you know, uh, science and engineering fields. Not enough women. Yet, look at all of you here. Keep going in animal behavior and medical sciences and environmental sciences. What else? What else can you do? I convinced you that you can't make a difference. Maybe. I swapped the answers. Causes change in all the earth. The, 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 the realistic consumption. The, the, there are severe problems that, you know, that the people taking the course will be facing that have been caused by people like from your age and my age that it's all your fault. necessarily have to uh, deal with. Um, so they take the course, and for a lot of them, it's a difficult experience because they haven't heard any of this before. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know they're they're bent on a career, which is a good thing, and they're spending a lot of money for education, probably a lot more than they really should be. Uh, How are you going to get that back? Planned by universities, mm -hmm. so it's a hard thing to hear. On top of that, but they're hearing it. Yeah. And at some point, uh, they'll be somewhat better prepared to have some shot at uh, doing something to, to aid them. And the reason that we want to educate girls is that Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead put it so long ago. Women are a whole lot smarter than men. I said it before, and I'll say it again. So let's let the smart people have access to education so they can make better decisions than what they made in the past. 
We'll see. A lot of women got elected to Congress last week. First we'll thing. see what happens. But you get the keys. You, you drive the car. The core of that has to do with women should be, do, be seen as more than bearers of children. Yeah. Controllers of the bearing of children would be nice. That would be nice. Good first step. Um, does awareness... This, this is, I think, one of the big questions that's going to be coming up and will be maybe figured out in the next decade or so. Does awareness actually lead to action? Just because you know about the problem, there is a very natural and, I think, very ethical response that is to run the other way and just, you know, get what you can. I call this the Exxon philosophy. Get, while you, get what you can now, and who cares about the future? You only live for 80 to 100 years, and you don't have an ethical responsibility to generations after you. It might work. You're, you're, you're nodding. OK, you were nodding on that one. What do you think now? That's, that's not the right thing to do. You don't agree with that? I'm looking, I'm looking at you. Yes. You, right there. So you're smiling, it's like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. 80 years and then I'm out. Punch the ticket and then I'm gone. It is an interesting approach. It's probably the wrong approach. I'm not sure though. It would seem like a really, you could have a really nice life this century, get all you can and then eject to Mars or somewhere. Um, I don't know, this is, this is, I mean, clearly Owen's generation caused this problem and my generation is publicizing this problem, and your generation has to fix it. You're welcome. Yeah, you. Anybody have any solutions besides this list of 200 solutions that I pointed you towards? Work on this stuff, please. We, we need you desperately. I would love to have this figured out for my kids and your kids so that all you have to worry about is student debt and not fires that sweep across an area the size of San Francisco and Oakland combined in one week. Any further questions? Bob, I'm going to let them go at 2.45 otherwise. You're not going to ask any questions because you want to go at 2.45. I'm letting you out half an hour early, but only if you promise to go work on these things or come down to the Wells Reserve and work on them with us, or take classes and come down to it. Thanks all, appreciate it. <laughs>